I would like to welcome Dr. F Fanny de Bouzerol, uh, now from Australia. So we have had presentations from the UK universities, and now we have a lady from down under, from Australia. I say welcome, Fanny. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank uh, first Fishbase and Michael and Andrea for inviting me and um, organizing my visit. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, deep sea fish vision. I'm going to first give you a little introduction about what are the visual condition in the deep sea. Um, some uh, of the most common visual adaptation that deep sea fish have. And then I'm going to spend quite some time during this talk um, giving uh, you uh, our latest results. And I'm going to give, tell you three stories about three different fish. And these stories are really challenging what we previously knew about uh, deep sea vision and even um, vertebrate vision in general. Um, but first, um, why vision? So contrary to what most people think, the deep sea environment is quite a visual environment. So you have two types of light in a deep sea. The downwelling light created by the sun, moon, stars and reaching depth of 1,000 meters. And you have bioluminescence, the light created by the animals themselves, and they use it for communication, to hide from predators, uh, to attract prey, and to camouflage. And my work focuses particularly on this part of the ocean, um, the mesopelagic zone, between 200 and 1,000 meters. And in this zone, um, the light uh, environment, oh. So no, that's not the <laughs> pointer. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so light zone in light uh, is, incre is increasingly dimmer with depth, and uh, bioluminescent flashes predominate. And it's in this zone that uh, the three species I will tell you about live. Um, oh, again, sorry. <laughs> the pearl side, the lantern fish, and the spiny fin. And uh, these fishes have uh, visual adaptation to see in dark condition and for viewing bioluminescence. So a little bit more about uh, the light conditions. So uh, due to the physical uh, properties of water, um, the light spectra or the color of the light and intensity uh, will vary with depth. Um, so you have the short and the long wavelength will rapidly be attenuated with depth only leaving blue light to the deeper levels. Uh, as a consequence, in the mesopelagic zone, you have uh, increasingly dimmer blue light that reaches these levels. And this is around seven, 470 to 480 nanometers. Bioluminescence, on the other hand, cover most wavelengths of the visible spectra. So here you have the number of species that emit bioluminescence as specific wavelength. And again, as adaptation to the light properties I just uh, mentioned, most bioluminescent emissions uh, fall within uh, 475 nanometers, which is corresponds to um, the light condition in a deep sea, the downwelling light. And although um, bioluminescence uh, is very present in the deep sea, uh, it's often very short signals and of very low intensity. So deep sea fish had to adapt to see in dark condition and for viewing bioluminescence. And the way we do that is we had to um, evolve some adaptation to increase the sensitivity of the eyes. So there are several ways to do that uh, at the ocular level, and I'm giving, going to give you some examples in lantern fishes. So one of the easiest ways to increase the chance of photo capture is to um, increase the size of your eye. And here you have uh, two different species of lantern fish with different eye size, and these species really evolve very large eyes, and it's a species that rely very uh, much on vision. Another way to increase the sensitivity of your eye is to have what we call an effective gap. So it is a gap between the iris and the lens, so the yellow line that you see, that allow light from oblique angles to reach the eye. And depending on the species and on the visual demand, um, you will have different size of effective gap and uh, in different locations. And these gaps are particularly useful to uh, detect bioluminescence um, from below, for example. 
Another adaptation is called um, a tapetum lucidum, which is a mirror that sits at the back of the eye and allows the light that hasn't been absorbed the first time by the eye to be reflected back and giving a chance uh, to the eye to have a second chance, basically, to capture the light. And that's what gives the eye shine of many nocturnal animals, uh, like the cat, for example. And in this lanternfish, you have a blue tapetum lucidum, giving a blue eye shine to the eye. And here it's other example in different species. This time the eye is open, and uh, you can see that the tapetum lucidum is part, like present a different part of the eye and has different colors. Again, depending on the visual demand of the animal. We observe also um, several adaptations at the retinal uh, level. And before I tell you about this adaptation, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the eye and how it works. So um, here you have the schematic representation of a fish eye, um, a section through the retina of a deep sea fish, and a schematic representation below. So it works, uh, the light goes uh, through the cornea, through the lens, and is focused onto the retina at the back of the eye. At this level, the light um, travels through all these different layers to reach the photoreceptors at the back of the eye. And it's the photoreceptor that will absorb the light signal, transform it into an electrical signal that will then travel back through these interneurons and then reach the ganglion cells that will send the information to the brain. And so today I'm going to focus on adaptation within this layer and I'm going to talk so more in, into detail about photoreceptors adaptation. So um, you all know that we have two types of photoreceptors, the cones and the rods, and uh, they differ in morphology and in the visual pigment, um, in the visual gene opsin that they possess. And each photoreceptor type is uh, adapted to function under uh, different light condition, allowing the animal to see during most of the 24-hour um, period. So um, rods are long and cylindrical, and they possess uh, the highly sensitive rhodopsin gene, RH1, and they mediate vision in dim conditions. Cones are short and distally tapered, and they possess up to four classes of opsin genes that are sensitive to different parts of the visible spectrum. Um, they are active in bright light conditions, and they mediate color vision. So most animals, and humans also, we possess both types of photoreceptors, cones and rods. And in fish, it's the same. And for example, uh, coral reef fish, all of them possess both cones and rods, even um, nocturnal species. In a deep sea, however, because most fish are only uh, subjected to very dim light -like condition, most deep sea fish has l have lost all their cones in favor of the very sensitive um, rod photoreceptors. So in addition um, to uh, processing a rod-only retina, a lot of species have increased the size, the length of their rod photoreceptors. So again, here an example in lanternfish between two different species. So we are going to look at this part of the photoreceptors, and which is here for this species, and all here for this one. And you can see that this species has nearly doubled the length um, of its rod photoreceptor. And that's, again, to increase the chance of photo capture, giving the photoreceptor more chance to catch the light. Um, some other species, like the spiny fin, evolve a completely different technique. Instead of increasing the length of their photoreceptors, um, they evolve what we call a multibank retina. And they just um, stack up different layers of rods on top of one another. Another um, way to increase the sensitivity of your eye is to possess photoreceptors that are particularly tuned to the light environment. So in a little bit more detail, so photoreceptors are um, composed of different parts, cell body, inner segment, and the outer segment. And it's this part of the photoreceptor that is absorbing the light signal. And it is the visual pigment that is situated inside the other segment that absorbs the light signal. And a visual pigment is composed of an opsin protein and a chromophore, and it's going to be the 
combination of both the opsin and the chromophore and also the specific um, amino acid sequence that you have in the opsin genes um, that is going to give the spectral sensitivity of uh, the photoreceptor. So here, for example, you have the spectral sensitivity of the photoreceptor of a rod photoreceptor of a deep sea fish. Um, and how we read those one is like we usually look at the maximum absorbance of this visual pigment, which is here, we call uh, lambda max. And in most deep sea fish, uh, these uh, photoreceptors are sensitive between maximally sensitive between 400 and 480 nanometers. And if you remember, that corresponds very well to the Dunwilling light uh, wavelength and to most bioluminescent signal. So their um, photoreceptor is really tuned to the light environment uh, in the deep sea. And uh, also most of the deep sea fish only possess one uh, photoreceptor with this spectral sensitivity. All right, so now I'm going to go on to these three different stories and tell you about the new visual adaptation that we found in deep sea fish. So we are going to start with the spiny fin. So the story of the spiny fin came out a little bit as an unexpected result uh, that came out of a bigger um, analysis that was um, laid by my two colleagues, uh, Fabio and Susanna. And uh, we analyzed the genome of uh, over 100 um, species of fish across the Valogeny, and we looked at the opsin genes of all these species. And it was pretty f presumably, like previously thought that uh, fish in general possessed a median of four um, opsin genes. So usually one rhodopsin and a combination of three conopsins. Now, um, when we looked at the results, uh, we were very surprised to find that fish have actually duplicated their opsin gene a lot more than previously thought. So you don't really need to understand this graph. This is the phylogeny and all the fish we looked at. And then each little bar represents one uh, opsin gene. And you can see there's a lot of bars showing that they are duplicating their opsin gene uh, very often, bringing now the median of opsin genes for fish to seven. But that was not the most surprising result. The most surprising result is that we found some deep sea fish that duplicated their Rh1 gene, so the gene that is in the rod cells. And it was presumably thought that deep sea fish only had one gene, rhodopsin gene, and one photoreceptor. So now we found five rhodopsin genes in uh, lantern fish six in tubas, and 38 in the spiny fin. 38 is making the spiny fin um, the animal with the highest opsin number in the animal kingdom so far. But what does it mean to have 38 rod opsin genes? Um, that might bring, like, give the fish uh, a way to see color. So, the prerequisite to see color vision is to be able to discriminate um, two different signals that are different in their wavelength. And the prerequisite for that is to possess two photoreceptor type, uh, two photoreceptors, sorry, that are active at the same time and that are different in their uh, spectral sensitivity. So, for example, two cones with different spectral sensitivity. Because most uh, vertebrates in fish in general uh, only possessed one rod photoreceptor, it was usually assumed that they were colorblind at night. Now, the spiny fin with, with its 38 rhodopsin might be able to see some kind of color if at least two of those rod photoreceptors have different spectral sensitivities. So, um, to check that, uh, we looked at um, what the fish eats actually using at one time, because the genome gives you the amount of genes the, the fish possess, but these genes might not be used uh, all the time. They might be used when they are larvae, and then adult, they might switch, and then some of them might never be used. So if you look into the RNA um, in the retina, we will know which obscene the fish is really using at that particular time. So we did just that for um, the spiny fin, and what we found was that these fish are using up to 48, 14, sorry, um, Rh1 gene at one time. 
And when we looked at the spectral sensitivities of those different genes, we can see that they are really spread out along the visual spectrum. And they are covering well the um, bioluminescence emission range and the unburned light of the deep sea. This means that for the spiny fin, um, we have 14 uh, rod photoreceptors that are active at the same time and have different spectral sensitivity. So this fish may potentially have um, the ability to see color vision, uh, to see color. Um, now, uh, the lantern fish story. Um, so lantern fishes are one of the most abundant families uh, of deep sea fish. And what we found is that some of the species uh, presented a yellow pigmentation into the retina. So here you have uh, a picture of the retina of a lantern fish that has been flattened out uh, by making some peripheral cuts, by like why it's looking like a flower. And you can see um, the yellow pigmentation present into the retina. And below, this is the retina of uh, any normal fish or any normal deep sea fish what it will look like uh, usually, so no yellow pigmentation. What you then see is that this yellow pigmentation is really segregated in specific parts of the retina, and that's going to be particularly interesting for um, uh, the vision of a fish in terms of visual ecology, uh, because light can enter the eye in very different angles. Um, this specialization is going to really focus in a specific part of the visual field of the animal. So, for example, here you have a lantern fish in a specialized retina. And due to the curvature of the eye, the yellow uh, pigmentation that is situated in the ventral part of the eye is going to receive visual information from the top. And um, the yellow pigmentation situated in the dorsal part of the eye is going to receive uh, visual information from uh, the bottom of the fish. So that means that this uh, specialization is really going to be really effective in specific parts of the visual field of the animal only. And any of the light that is not going to reach, um, uh, that is going to come from all the other direction, is not going to be affected by this specialization. So uh, in lantern fishes, we found different species with this yellow pigmentation, and we found that the cis pigmentation was species specific and differed in number of patches, in location of the patch, shape, and even intensity with these two species have a really low uh, intensity in, in yellow pigmentation. What was uh, even more surprising is uh, for two of the species we analyzed, we found this yellow pigmentation to be sexually dimorphic. And that again, it's the first observation of sexual dimorphism in the eye of any non primate vertebrate. So it was very really exciting. Um, so in this example, you have the male that has uh, a yellow pigmentation here. This is uh, the head of the lantern fish for orientation, and the female, a little patch in the center. Uh, this is another species with uh, sexually dimorphic yellow pigment with a patch here for the male and a band shaped patch here for the female. Now, it is unknown if it's the other species that has this pigmentation also have a sexually dimorphic pigmentation because we didn't have access to uh, enough individuals from both sex to check that. All right, so what is this yellow pigmentation doing? Um, to check that, we measure the light transmission uh, through the retina of two different species of lantern fish with different uh, yellow pigment intensity. And so we measure the light transmission through a white patch of the retina with the white curve, and that's the control if you want. And you can see that uh, the light is not transmitted equally through all the wavelength, with the short wavelength being less transmitted. Now, if we look at the light transmission through the yellow patches of the two uh, species, uh, we can see that uh, the short wavelength have a completely carried out um, below 400 nanometers for one species and below uh, 450 for the other species. That means that this yellow pigmentation is acting as a filter, selectively cutting out shorter wavelengths. Now, this yellow pigmentation is present in the photoreceptor cell itself, and it's present in uh, the cell body. That means that when the light enters the eye, the short wavelengths are going to be selectively cut out at this level before they reach 
meet a segment where the visual pigment is. So we looked at the gene that the vessel and fish possess um, in the eye. And again, we were very surprised to find a sexual dimorphism in uh, the opsin gene that this species possess. So the male has two Rh1 uh, opsin and a female three. What was even more surprising is that the male and the female possess completely different copies. So they don't even share one of these opsin gene copies uh, between the two sex. Um, so that's still work in, in progress. So we don't know yet at the moment if uh, male and female have uh, genes uh, and photoreceptors that are different spectral sensitivities. But what we do know is that the male, uh, the two uh, photoreceptor type in the male have different spectral sensitivities. So here we measure um, the absorbance of the different rod photoreceptor in this male in the white part, so the white line, and in the yellow part, the yellow line. And so you can see that one of these uh, photoreceptors is sensitive to around 475 nanometers, which again, is that's a classic DC fish visual pigment. Um, and then the other photoreceptor that is present in yellow pigmentation is long wave shifted toward uh, around 530 nanometers. All right, that's a lot of information, um, but what I mean here also, similarly to the spiny fin, is that uh, these lantern fish have two rod photoreceptors that are active at the same time and have diff different spectral sensitivities. So again, here a potential for color vision. Um, so what does that all mean for the visual system of the lantern fish and what is the yellow pigment doing? So here you have the sensitivity curves of uh, the two photoreceptor types that are present in this lantern fish. So again, the white curve is the photoreceptor present in the white part of the retina and the yellow curve, the photoreceptor present in the yellow part of the retina. And you can see that this photoreceptor, by being a little bit more long wave shifted, is also became more sensitive to shorter wavelength. Now, if we add the effect of the yellow pigment onto this photoreceptor, this is what we get. The yellow pigment, by uh, selectively cutting out shorter wavelength before they reach the photoreceptor, is making this photoreceptor more sensitive to longer wavelength only, cutting out possible noises. So here you have another example with a different species. Uh, this time on this species, species, the two photoreceptors have a spectral sensitivities that are uh, closer to one another and the yellow pigmentation is a bit more intense in color. So again, if we add uh, the effect of the yellow pigment onto this photoreceptor, this is what we get. So by really cutting out most of the shorter wavelength, we can see that this, the sensitivity of this photoreceptor has, is a lot more sensitive and specific to longer wavelength only. Um, now, uh, because uh, the deep sea is not a very dark environment, well, at least the mesopelagic zone, because you have some downwind light, we think that uh, this yellow pigment is um, acting as a filter and cutting out most of, most of the background irradiance of the downwind light, making uh, bioluminescence um, signal um, more significant and giving more contrast, basically. Um, so, to summarize a little bit uh, this uh, data for the lantern fish, so uh, lantern fish also duplicate uh, their Rh1 genes, and we have at least two rod photoreceptors that with different spectral sensitivities, so maybe these fish have a potential for color vision. Um, the yellow pigmentation acts as a filter to enhance uh, bioluminescent signals. And we have a sexual dimorphism in opsins and in yellow pigmentation. Now, um, these results have been observed in species that are also sexually dimorphic in their luminous organs. So with the male having a luminous organ on the top of the tail and the female at the bottom of the tail. And that suggests that their slant and fish may use a private communication channel uh, between potential mates and that maybe color also is involved in sexual communication. 
All right, so last um, story for today, uh, the pearl side. Pearl side live in the upper part of the mesopelagic zone. And similarly to uh, most deep sea fish, they have been described to have a pure rod retina. However, um, this behavior, their behavior is at odd with this visual system. So the normal uh, classic behavior in the mesopelagic zone is to perform um, dial vertical migration. So here is an example uh, with a lanternfish. So lanternfish migrates at sunset towards the surface, eat at the surface in the food rich layer, and then go back to the daytime depth uh, during the day to hide from predators. Again, because their fish are mainly active in dim light conditions, um, they possess a pure rod retina. Now, the pearl side, um, the pearl side migrate at sunset, eat, then sink to deeper depth without eating, then migrate at sunrise, eat, and then go back to its daytime depth. Now, this behavior is best explained by the anti-predation window theory that states that it may be advantageous to spend short period of time at dusk and dawn when light levels are sufficient to detect prey, but low enough to hide from predators. And in this um, light condition, usually uh, animals have a combination of cones and rods to see. Um, all the perside have been described to have a pure, co a pure rod retina, sorry. So what is going on with this visual system? Do they really possess a pure rod retina? And if yes, how can they see at dusk and dawn without the cones? And why do they not eat at night? So to elucidate this paradox, we looked at the visual system of two per-size species. Um, and um, we first looked at the obscene genes that this fish possess by looking at the retinal transcriptome, so how many of these obscene genes they possess at one time and they are using. And this is um, the result. So the results were nearly identical between the two species. And pearl site possess three obscene genes. One RH1 gene, the rhodopsin, um, so that's a classic deep sea. And two conopsin, two RH2 genes. Now the two RH2 genes are nearly identical. So to simplify uh, for the rest of the story, I will refer to them as one. So, um, now we wanted to look at uh, the expression level of each of its genes, meaning like um, how much each of the gene is used by the fish. And it was very surprising to find that the conopsin, the H2 gene, comprised 99% of the total opsin expression. That means that this fish nearly rely 100% of its cone opsin for vision. And that's something you will expect in a fish that doesn't have any rods at all, because this is the opsin that you find in a cone. So then we say, OK, what's going on at the morphological level then? Can we find any cone cells in the retina of this fish? So um, we did some labeling with uh, opsin-specific probe. And what we found was, similarly to previous result, we couldn't identify any cone cells morphologically. So if you remember, at the beginning I told you that the photoreceptors, rods and cone, are defined by their morphology, so their shape, and the obscene genes they possess. So because we found a really high uh, expression of cone obscene in this fish, we will expect to at least find a few uh, cells that look like a cone. But we didn't find that. So you see that um, this uh, labeled cell in black uh, are all expressed in cells that are rod-looking, so really long and cylindrical. And in addition to that, uh, most of the cell express the cone opsin uh, RH2, which collaborate very well with the molecular data. So next, we looked at the ultrastructural level, so what's going on inside the cell, to look for any cone feature. Um, and we reconstructed in 3D uh, the two photoreceptor types. Uh, here you have the schematic representation of the two photoreceptor type. Uh, the rod like cone is the photoreceptor that is um, possessing the RH2 gene, so the cone gene. 
and the rod is the one that uh, contains the RH1 gene, so the rod photoreceptor gene. And I'm going to play you a little movie of this uh, 3D reconstruction of the two types. Um, so here uh, you have sections, different sections through the retina of the fish, and you're going to see uh, the reconstruction of the two types of photoreceptors. Um, so both cells have a long and cylindrical outer segment, which is typical of a rod cell. Um, at the inner segment level here, you can see that uh, there is a lot of mitochondria, so all the little round cells are mitochondria, and they're both the same in both uh, cell type, uh, and there is no other feature that indicates that it could be a cone photoreceptors. And at the cell body um, level, part that is important is the synaptic terminal, so this part here, and this part for both cell photoreceptor type is small and quite simple, and that's also a rod feature. And the only uh, differences or important differences we found between these two cells was uh, at the level of the synaptic terminal, like I said, and the cone uh, synaptic terminal is a bit more complex and has uh, three synaptic rebounds, so that's little uh, black band that you see. You only see two here because it's a 2D picture. And the rod uh, synaptic terminal only has two. Again, you can only see one here. And it's a lot simpler uh, synaptic terminal. And basically, this is the only cone feature we have in this cell. Um, so basically, what we have is has the Purcell as a visual system that is nearly exclusively composed of uh, photoreceptors that are combining the characteristics of both cones and rods into a single cell. Um, so here, the morphology of a rod and the opsin gene of a cone. And that's called uh, photoreceptor transmutation. So now, photoreceptor transmutation has been first observed by uh, Walls in 1942 and that was observed in snake and gecko. And it came out with the photoreceptor um, transmutation theory that states um, that one uh, rod and cone could evolve or transmit into one another via a series of intermediate states as a result of a major ecological shift in activity pattern. So for example, uh, the gecko ancestor was strictly diurnal and as a result had a retina only composed of cone. And modern nocturnal, oops, sorry. <laughs> modern nocturnal geckos um, transmitted, transformed their cone cell into rod-like receptor to be able to regain uh, vision in dim light conditions. So photoreceptor transmutation has been observed so far in snakes, squamate reptiles, skates, and lampreys. And the pearl side is the first case of transmutation in any teleos fish. However, um, contrary to all the previous cases, we do not think that this transmutation happened for the same reason in uh, pearl side. And we think it happened for an ecological, as an ecological adaptation. So the likely explanation for this peculiar visual system in the pearl side is an adaptation to the specific light condition that there is in the environment. So here you have a schematic um, of uh, differ different photoreceptor functionality in the different light illuminations. So scotopic is uh, defined by the use of rod photoreceptor only, mesopic by the use of rod and cone photoreceptor together, and photopic by the use of cone photoreceptor only. And the light conditions are starlight, moonlight, civil twilight, sunset, sunrise, and sunlight. Now, um, when I introduced the pearl side, I told you about their behavior and the fact that they are mainly active uh, at dusk and dawn at the surface when they eat. That means that they have a very restricted uh, range of intensity um, that they are subjected to, which are represented here by this box. And so, um, normally under this condition, most animals use both rods and cones. Um, but the pearl side came out with a more economical and um, efficient solution by uh, combining the characteristics of both cell types into a single photoreceptor uh, that is going to be sensitive 
uh, really to these like conditions. In addition to be uh, more sensitive to uh, this uh, light intensities, these photoreceptors are also tuned to the light environment of uh, the twilight where they live. And so here you have, um, oh, I will not manage this uh, pointer. Um, so here you have a different um, light spectra under different condition and a different depth. So the dark uh, curve is the light spectrum uh, at the surface uh, during twilight. The green curve is the light spectrum at the surface um, during the night. And the light blue is the light spectrum at uh, 500 meter deep, so in a deep sea during the day. And if you uh, notice the light spectrum during twilight and at night at the same depth, you can see that at twilight the light spectrum is very blue shifted. Now, if we overlay um, the spectral sensitivity of the photoreceptor of each species that live under the specific condition, we can see that the photoreceptor is also very tuned to the specific light condition in a different environment. And the pearl side with this photo transmitted photoreceptor is um, very tuned to the blue shifted condition of this environment. So to summarize the pearl side story, uh, the pearl side has a transmitted visual system which is the first case in a teleos fish. Uh, they have a cone-based visual system, which is why they do not feed at night, because their cone opsin is not sensitive enough um, to see in very, very dark conditions. Um, it's the first case of an adult fish using exclusively a cone opsin for vision. And that also the world story bring a new piece of the puzzle on the evolution and adaptation of the vertebrate visual system in general and also our own visual system. Um, but that's not all. It also uh, means that the definition of rods and cones is a lot more flexible than we previously thought and that us visual scientists, we have to be very careful how we categorize this type of photoreceptors. And um, that means also that we need to do more comprehensive analysis of the visual system uh, of a lot of different species and in general, and that uh, we might find other cases of transmutation. And this uh, transmutation might also be an alternative mechanism for color vision. So although the pearl side cannot see color, uh, we have looked at that, it's not possible in the case of this fish, uh, this adaptation, this transmutation, the fact of mixing both rods and cone characteristics into single cells may be able to provide a mechanism for color vision in other species if uh, that ends up giving the species two photoreceptor types that are active at the same time with different spectral sensitivities. So all of us, uh, all of that brings us to more general um, conclusion in future work. So we found some deep sea fish that duplicate their AOH1 opsins and uh, they have also spect different spectral sensitivity. So we may have fish or deep sea fish with a potential for color vision. Um, we also find some sexual dimorphism in the eye of some lantern fish in the opsin and in the retina and that indicates that bioluminescence may be used, well, it's another indication that bioluminescence is used in sexual communication, and that maybe color may, may be involved in uh, this sexual communication. And then we have the photoreceptor transmutation in fish, that also may contribute to give an alternative color vis alternative color vision mechanism. So all this means that fish may use color information in a variety of dim light settings. Um, so far, uh, color vision in dim light has been observed in very few animals, the gecko and the frogs. Uh, so why not fish? As human, we cannot see color in the dark. So this uh, adaptation has been quite overlooked in any other um, animals in general. And so we will investigate that in the next three years uh, in a project funded by the Australian government and we'll try to uh, elucidate if fish can see color vision in the dark using uh, more deep sea fish and also some uh, nocturnal coral reef fish. Now, what, uh, the example I show you um, in the deep sea 
are potential for color vision. That means like they can maybe see color vision, but we need to go a lot deeper and see what are the other uh, processing uh, further down in the retina, further down in the brain, uh, to be able really to know if they can see color vision. But in any case, um, deep sea fish are really interesting and uh, are bringing a lot of discovery in the visual um, world, and there is a lot more uh, to find out. And they also can tell us a little bit more about the behavior of those um, fish, which we know very little about. And with that, I would like to uh, thank all the people that have been involved in the data that I presented today, and also you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Fanny. It was very interesting, but very complicated, at least yeah. according to me. Um, so, Fanny is ready for questions. Any questions from the audience? I lost everyone, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have a question, mm -hmm. or maybe two, and you can think about questions. Uh, so, Fish in the Deep, what would you say is the main purpose of visual or... Uh, color um, possibilities because when we talk about the deep sea we you said it's not dark it's not black but it's very low light it is very low light definitely it's not dark because bioluminescence is very very common most of the deep sea animals uh, emit bioluminescence and especially in this zone that i mentioned so although we think about the deep sea as being dark you have to think about like the bioluminescence signal coming from any direction and uh, uh, like being very common and that's what animals down there are using for many different purposes for communication like to find a mate to attract prey, to uh, hide from predators um, to camouflage themselves in this like condition so it's really visual in terms of bioluminescent signal and then with the light coming from the top and reaching some of its depth you can also see some shadows and silhouettes of animals um, so it's, it is a visual environment. After that, we are talking about this specific zone of the ocean, the mesopelagic zone, where you have both downwelling and bioluminescence. If you go uh, a lot deeper, then it's a lot darker, and then you only have bioluminescent signals. And of course, because the deeper you go, the less uh, fauna and biomass you have, then bioluminescent signals are going to be less predominant because you have less animals there. So it's really important when you go deeper. Well, the deeper is going to be different visual adaptation, only to see bioluminescence. Okay. Um, yeah. Short question. Yeah. Is, is, my obs is obsin a protein? Is yes. obsin a protein? So the is a protein, and uh, but the protein is made from the obsin gene. So my other question, you, you mentioned the pearl side, mm -hmm. and they are moving up and down between 200 meters and the surface. Yeah. But do they need to do that for feeding, or is that an option for them? Or they are, they, I mean, do they need, are they uh, guided by the light, or? Yes, so um, the pearl side, so I didn't mention, but we have actually studied the pearl side from Norway and the pearl side from the Red Sea. And in Norway, the life cycle is a lot more variable with seasons. And so the um, migration of the pearl site is also very affected by uh, seasonal light. So they don't have always the same migration pattern depending on the light availability uh, at a depending season. But they definitely migrate um, to eat like most fish, where they go where there is the most food. And the last question, if audience doesn't have one. Because I think it was very, very interesting with the sexual dimorphism for mm -hmm. colors in one and same species. And then you mentioned the coloration on the tail there. So it's, uh, we don't know if uh, male and female are emitting bioluminescence of different color. Uh, there's so much we don't know about deep sea fish uh, in like their behavior and also in their bioluminescence. So that's unknown. 
But what uh, we see in the eyes is like they have a potential to discriminate color. Like again, it's a potential, but it doesn't mean that they are actually able to see color. And the only way to know is actually to ask the fish. And we can do that with shallow water fish, with coral reef fish. We do a behavioral experiment and we actually ask the fish, so can you see this color? And uh, they do answer. <laughs> But with deep sea fish, we cannot do this type of experiment. We cannot keep them in aquarium. So the only thing we can do is look at what they have and say, OK, that's the potential they have. And then uh, do some theoretical modeling and try to look further in how they process it in their brain. And then wait for better technology <laughs> to do this type of experiment. So people in the, the young people in the room here can start now to think about new scientific uh, roads huh? and take care. Uh, contact with Fania. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you.